We are so thankful that you have made the choice to tune in for one of ACC's messages. You know, as you're listening and diving into the truths that are being shared, we challenge you. If you're sitting at your phone or at your computer, hop on social media and be sure to use the hashtag, you belong at ACC, as God is teaching you different things during this message. You belong at ACC and we truly mean that, which means that we would love to have you join us during one of our Sunday services at 710 Aqua Heart Road. We would love to have you jump into this message and we are believing God is going to do some awesome things in your life today. All right, so right now we're wrapping up a series called Movers and Shakers. And if you're not sure what a mover and a shaker is, a mover and a shaker, right, is that person who's willing to do whatever it takes to get something done, right? And so in in the context of the church, what we're all about here, right, is we want to become more like Jesus. And so a mover and a shaker in their faith is someone who's willing to do the hard things, make a couple things, move some things around, shake some things up to become more like Jesus. And I want us to be a church of movers and shakers. And so for the past three weeks, We've talked about how if you want to be a mover and a shaker, right, you have to uh, worship regularly. And then you also have to grow personally. And then last week we talked about how you have to connect relationally through life groups. Well, today we're going to talk about the next thing that I want to talk to you about, which is essentially serve sacrificially. If you want to be a mover and a shaker in your faith, if you want to drastically increase the speed at which you become like Jesus, one of the things you're going to do is this. You're going to serve sacrificially. Well, what does that mean? I love that we're talking about this concept of serve sacrificially because it actually brings up my favorite Bible verse in all of Scripture. And whenever I get an opportunity to preach out of my favorite passage of Scripture, I get excited, all right? So I hope you're going to join me in that excitement today. But Romans 12, my favorite passage is Romans 12, 1 and 2. But today I'm going to just show you Romans 12, verse 1, and it says this. And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all that he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy what? Sacrifice. There's the word we're going to talk about today. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. So we have to stop there. We're we're talking about serving sacrificially. That word sacrificially has the word sacrifice in it. What does the word sacrifice mean? What does it mean to sacrifice? I think a good place to start is just looking at a dictionary definition of the word, okay? If you pull this word up in the dictionary, you're probably going to have a bunch of different definitions, but one that really kind of sums it up, I think, really well is this. Giving something that you value for something else you consider more important. That's what a sacrifice is, right? When we sacrifice something, we're giving up something that we value in exchange for something that we consider more important. I'm going to teach you all a a sign in American Sign Language, okay? So you all get to learn this with us. It's actually the word sacrifice, okay? So you're going to put your hands closed-fisted, fingers down like this, all right? And to do the sign for sacrifice, you're going to open up your hands as you bring them up. You're going to open up your hands as you bring them up. So if you watch our interpreter for American Sign Language, and I say the word sacrifice, (laughs) you see, you just learned something today. But here's the beauty of this sign. Sacrifice is giving up something that you find important and is is valuable in exchange for something more important, right? That's what sacrifice is. That's what we're all called to do. If we want to be a mover and a shaker in our faith, we're going to sacrifice. But this verse talks about something else. It talks about being a living sacrifice. Now, what's a living sacrifice? You know, one thing I think that you'll notice about a living sacrifice is a living sacrifice, uh, living sacrifices tend to crawl off the altar. You notice that. If you put something alive on an altar to sacrifice it, it's probably going to do everything it can to get off of that altar and somewhere else. 
And the same is true for us. It's very difficult to be a living sacrifice. And here's what the difference is. A living sacrifice is a sacrifice that's made from a place of freedom and choice. It's when you choose to present yourself as a sacrifice. You willingly get on that altar and you don't crawl off. That's a living sacrifice. A really great example of this is at the very beginning of the book of Romans, Paul calls himself something interesting. Paul introduces himself in Romans chapter 1, and he calls himself a bond servant. I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but what is a bond servant? Well, most of the time when you explore the concept of slavery in Scripture, it's a lot different than the slavery you would hear about in our history books. The the, the slavery oftentimes, not every time, but most of the time we read about in Scripture is more like this bond servant. And let me tell you what this was, all right? If, you borrow, if I borrowed money from someone, I wanted to buy a farm and b- work some land, so I borrowed some money from someone, and then I was unable to pay it back. Essentially, I stole money, right? I, I, you gave it to me. I promised to give it back. I did not give it back. I would get put in debtor's prison. I would get put in prison, and then what someone would do, someone with a lot of money, and maybe, a, 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 maybe they care, maybe they don't, would come and buy me out of prison into this seven-year process where for seven years I have to serve in their home, I have to take care of their farm, their land, do whatever it is that they need me to do. And for seven years, what they've done is they've paid my debt to the person I borrowed money from. They pay my debt to someone else, and now I get to work, work off my debt for seven years. And then after seven years, guess what? I'm free. I'm no longer under the obligation to be a servant in this home. But some people will have just ingrained themselves and and fallen in love with the family and the people that they work with, that they would choose freely after the seven-year period was over to stay and continue to serve in that home as an employee. They were now free to leave but they would choose to continue to do the work that they were doing. And if they were doing that, they would call themselves a bond servant. And they would actually take a nail and, and basically pierce their ear with it and wear a, a nail in their ear. It was a way of saying, I am a bond servant. I am choosing to serve in this household. I have the freedom to leave, but I'm not going to. And so when Paul calls himself a bondservant, it's really this illustration of a living sacrifice. He's saying, I choose to be a sacrifice, to be a living sacrifice because of what God has done for me. So that's this concept of a living sacrifice. But why would we do this? And so if you have your notes this morning, you have some fill in the blanks. I have three things I want to highlight out of Romans chapter 12, verse 1. And it's essentially why we serve sacrificially, all right? So the first one, we serve sacrificially because, you ready for this? God sacrificed for us. Now, how many of you, one of your favorite thing to do when you have a fill in the blank is to guess what the word is before the pastor tells you? Yeah, how many of you knew I was going to say sacrifice and you already had it written down? Yes, I see some of you, you you're, you're reading my mind, I love it, all right? Well, the first fill in the blank is God sacrificed for us. Let's pull up um, Romans 12, chapter 1, one more time. I underlined a couple of words here. You notice it says, and so. Your your Bible might say, therefore. And right, every time the Bible says, therefore, we're supposed to ask ourselves, what is it therefore? What is it pointing back to? And in this case, Romans 12 is like a, it's like, taking all of Romans 1 through 11 and saying all that information I just shared with you, all of that, we're now going to go on to the second half of Romans. Romans 12 is like this transition verse. And so, in light of everything we just talked about in Romans 1 through 11, and then it also says, because of all he has done for you. You see, if you go through the book of Romans 1 through 11, chapters 1 through 11, we have this this beautiful very clear presentation of the gospel. 
You know what Romans chapters 1 through 11 tells us? It, it, one of the things it's going to tell you is that every single one of us in this room, we are all sinners. Not a single uh, exception to the rule. It also is going to tell us that the punishment for our sin is death. That we are going to, because of our brokenness, because God is holy and he is light and in him there is no darkness, the punishment for our sin is eternal separation from God. That's bad news. But then it goes on to switch to good news. In Romans 1 through 11, it says, but God loved you so much, right? It goes on to explain that he was willingly sent Jesus to the cross to die in your place. And in Romans 10, it says that when you put your faith in Jesus, when you trust in him and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, that his perfectness will be attributed to you and your sin will be paid for on the cross. And we get this thing that we call the, the gospel, the good news. And so when Paul writes this verse and he says, and so what he's simply saying is because of the good news of the gospel, because the fact that you were broken and, and, and sentenced to eternity apart from God, and yet he, he gave you a way out of that through Jesus Christ. Therefore, this. Therefore, because of all that he has done for you. Let me share with you some, some verses quickly that highlight the and so, okay? Philippians 2, it says... He, he humbled himself. This is Jesus. He humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on the cross. And so, you see what I did there? What about Mark 10, verse 45? For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. And so... So, so what? So what, what do we do? That's, that's what Romans 12, 1 does so beautifully. It says, because of that, we've got to do something now. Do you know that Jesus, think about this philosophically for just a minute. Jesus could have come at any moment in history. When God made a promise that one day, he, he said to the serpent, right, one day a descendant of Eve will come and crush your head. It was a promise. We know that one point in, in, in that future from that moment, Jesus was going to come and pay for our sin. He could have sent Jesus today. He could have said, I'm not going to come uh, 2,000 years ago. I'm going to send Jesus at this point, that this would be zero on our calendar, this would have made a lot more sense. If I were God, I'm like, I'm going to send Jesus when there's a whole bunch of laws in place and a whole bunch of conventions that have happened. And now when we, when we execute someone, we have to do it in a, in a way that's not cruel and unusual. We just put someone down. But do you know God chose to send his son into this earth, the one moment in history where the most agonizingly painful torturous version of execution ever invented was in existence, and it was called crucifixion. That's when God chose to send Jesus to pay for your sin. He could have done it now, but he chose the nails. He chose to suffocate on a cross. God chose to send his son then. He sacrificed for us. You see, a sacrifice isn't a sacrifice unless it costs something. Remember the definition is sacrifice is when you give up something of value for something else you consider more important. I want you to think about that phrase right there when it comes to God sacrificing his son on a cross. He gave up something of value for something he considered more important. Don't let that in fact, I want to share with you some more verses. John 3, 16. You probably have this one memorized in the NIV or KJV, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. Don't miss it. God so loved the world that he, what's the verb here? He gave. He opened up his hands and sacrificed something of value for something he considered more important. What is that about? That whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. 
He sacrificed and gave his son. He gave up something very incredibly valuable for someone he considered more important. Let's look at another verse. In 1 John 4, 9, it says, God showed how much he loved us by sending his one and only son into the world so that we might have eternal life through him. I hope you understand the power of verses like this. The God who can measure the entirety of the universe, according to Isaiah, and Isaiah is just trying to give us a word picture. It says that God can measure the entirety of the universe with the breadth of his hand. A breadth is a distance from your pinky to your thumb when you stretch it out. A breadth, God can just walk up to the entirety of the universe and measure it with one breadth of his hand. And that God, for some reason, knows your name and cares about your existence. Not only that, but he chose to give up something very valuable for that little speck that is you. Is that not crazy? It sounds weird. It doesn't make sense to us. You want to make this, let me share another verse with you. This one's kind of like, this one really kind of makes your head almost explode. You ready? Ephesians chapter 1 verses 4 and 5, it says, even before he made the world. By the way, God knew before he even made man that we were going to screw it all up. He already knew you were going to exist. And before you were even a thought in your parents' eyes, before Adam and Eve even existed, before the creation of the world, God already had a plan to redeem you. It says God loved us and he chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This, you ready for this? This is the hardest to understand sentence. You ready? It says, this is what he wanted to do and it gave him great pleasure. God decided before creation that he was gonna send his son to die the most agonizing version of execution ever invented, that he was gonna send Jesus to do that for you, and according to scripture, it gave him great pleasure to do so. He gave up something incredibly valuable for something else he considered more important. You see, God sacrificed for you. That's the and so. And so, because God was willing to sacrifice his own son on the cross for you, therefore, we've got to do something It doesn't make sense to us. It doesn't make sense that God would choose to accept me as one of his children. It doesn't make sense to me. It doesn't make sense to me that God would give his only son in exchange for me. Can I just tell you, that was a bad trade. It doesn't make sense to me. It doesn't make sense that God would want to know my name and care about my thoughts hear my prayers. It doesn't make sense that God would choose to keep track of the number of hairs on my head, though that job is a lot easier these days for him. (laughs) It doesn't make sense to me that an all-powerful, all-knowing, omniscient, omnipotent, that that God would choose to humble himself to the place of being born in a human body even without the sacrifice. That doesn't make sense to me. Why would God do all of this? And my point is, is not only that he did it, but that he chose to do it. This is what a living sacrifice is. The reason that we ought to serve sacrificially, number one, is that God sacrificed for us. It says in 1 Samuel 12, verse 24, it says, but be sure to fear the Lord and faithfully serve him. Why? It says, think of all the wonderful things that he has done for you. Which actually leads us to the second reason. All right, number two, we serve sacrificially 
because we owe our life to God. Listen, believer, you owe your life to God. If we pull up Romans 12, 1 again, and I want you to just zoom in on this last sentence here. Remember Romans 12? We've been reading it together all morning. Uh, this last sentence, it says, this is truly the way to worship him. This concept of presenting yourself as a living sacrifice, according to scripture, this is truly the way we worship him. That phrase, this is truly, it actually comes from one Greek word, not, yeah, one Greek word. If you go back to the original Greek, it's the word uh, logikin, where we get our word, what? Any guesses? Logic. In other words, a, a valid translation of the original Greek for this sentence is presenting yourself as a sacrifice just makes sense. It's just a common thing that you would do. In other words, you've probably heard of this concept of a, a life debt. Have you ever heard of a, a concept of a life debt? Here, here's a life debt. It's when someone saves your life, you basically owe them a, a life debt. Like, I, I'm your man. You ever need anything? You saved my life. I owe you. A really great example of this, uh, uh, two really great examples that come to mind. One, my Star Wars fans, right? is Chewbacca and his relationship with Han Solo. This is the concept of a life debt. I owe you my life. Wherever you go, I go. Also, my favorite movie of all time. I have two favorite movies, but one of them is The Count of Monte Cristo. It's such a powerful example of a life debt. There's, there's a, a pirate in, in the movie who uh, The Count of Monte Cristo saves his life, and then that guy basically says, I'm your man. Wherever you go, I go. A life debt. You see, simply put, because God sent his son to die on the cross for you to save your life, you now owe your life to him. It's a life debt. You know, under the old covenant, I mean, the Old Testament, when you read about things, when, when people had done something wrong, when people sinned against God, the way that that would be atoned is you'd bring in a sacrifice, Right? You would bring an animal onto an altar and it would be sacrificed and the blood would, would be a temporary covering for your sin. But there's a reason why we don't bring animals when we come here on Sunday mornings anymore. Aren't you thankful you didn't have to bring something to sacrifice on this stage today? And here's why. In Hebrews 9, 12, it says, with his own blood, we're talking about Jesus, not the blood of goats and calves, he entered the most holy place once for all time and secured our redemption forever. In other words, what it says is Jesus' sacrifice was a once for all time sacrifice. It was a sacrifice that once that sacrifice was made, his blood on the cross was good enough to cover all of our sin. We, didn't, we don't need to bring animals to sacrifice anymore. Jesus took care of it. So now what scripture says, listen, you don't need to bring an animal to sacrifice, but the logical thing, the thing that makes sense of what you should now be sacrificing in light of what God has done for you is to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, ready to do whatever God wants you to do. Now I want you to think deeply with me for just a moment. We call it a sacrifice, but is it really a sacrifice if you really think about it? Let me give you an example. I would be willing right now, if anybody wants to, I'd be willing to sacrifice a $20 bill in exchange for your $100 bill. <laughs> now, none of you in this room would consider that a sacrifice. If you said, wow, man, that's a really valuable 20 bucks. I can't believe Matt was so willing to just sacrifice that thing in exchange for 100 like, no one in this room would consider that a sacrifice. You would say, we gave up something of value, but for something much more valuable, something much more important. Likewise, I don't think anyone in this room would really consider it a sacrifice to say, ah, oh, man, I'm going to give up the next, on average, 80 years of my life to do whatever it is that God wants me to do uh, in exchange and because of 
the value of knowing that he's bought my life for eternity with him. Is that really a sacrifice? Right? It's not, it's not a sacrifice when you really think about it. And one of the, there, there's a missionary who was a missionary in India. Her name is Amy Carmichael. You read a lot of uh, autobi- or biographies about Amy Carmichael's life, but she has this quote, and it's this, when I consider the cross of Christ, how can anything I do be called a sacrifice? It kind of shifts your perspective, doesn't it? We're called to present our bodies as a living sacrifice, but at the end of the day, the things that we do, it's not really a, a it's a no-brainer. It's logikin. It's just a logical thing to do. But here's the third thing. Third fill in the blank. We serve sacrificially because number three, it is a practical way to give our bodies to God. When we serve our world with our bodies, when we go out and we serve our community with our hands and our feet, right? When we serve within the walls of this church and help this church and other people in it grow into Christ likeness, when we help other people become transformed and released by the love of Jesus. When we do that, it's just a practical way of offering our bodies, my hands, my feet, my arms, my whatever, my voice, my whatever I got, I'm gonna give it all in service to God because it's the logical thing to do. It's a practical way to present my body as a living sacrifice. If you go back again, Romans 12, 1, it says really clearly, and so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God. And then it says, the next underlined part, it says, let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. Remember, we talked about that. It's the kind of sacrifice that you make willingly because you recognize all that God has done for you. You see, when you serve in the church, when you serve throughout this community and around the world, you're giving up parts of your body, aren't you? You're giving up the talents of your body. By the way, you could take your talents and just say, you know what, these talents are for me. I can use them to make much of myself. I can use them to make money. I can use them to make fame. I can use them, you can, get, you can use all your talents just to make much of you. But what happens when we use our bodies as a living sacrifice, we say, I wanna give up my talents to serve a God who died on the cross for me. We also, we're giving our energy. When you go out and serve, sometimes maybe there's a reason. You're like, well, I really need my energy because I got this big project I'm working on or I know that the ravens are gonna be, like they're gonna need all my energy today and they're gonna need all my up and down. They're not gonna win unless I'm jumping up and down. So I need my energy for that and so I I better uh, save it. No, we we present our bodies as a living sacrifice to say, I'm going to give up my energy. I'm going to give up what I got to to serve the one who sent his son for me. You also give up the comfort of your body, don't you? You know, when we serve God in some, it's, listen, I'm in a place, most of you maybe matured to a place where serving the local church is a joy for you. You love doing it. But can we all admit there's days that it's really hard to get out of bed? That we'd rather be comfortable? Like there are days where our parking team, you can just tell how much fun they're having out there. They just love it. But then there's gonna be days coming up here in the next few months where it's snowing and raining on them. They're freezing out there and they're still gonna be waving at you and helping you and welcoming you onto our parking lot, not because they're comfortable, but because they love Jesus and they wanna serve you. We have students in our ACC student ministry, uh, uh, or, or leaders in our ACC students ministry. I can tell you, they're not going to spend a week at camp with your kids because they like sleeping on a mattress this thick. I promise you, they don't enjoy it. But they're willing to give up the comfort of their body to serve something that they find more valuable, which is to watch your young people fall in love with Jesus. When you serve in our nursery or our preschool and one of those little kids bites down on your finger out of frustration, I'm telling you, that's not a comfortable moment. But we're willing to 
sacrifice our bodies and the comfort of our bodies so that our young people can meet Jesus. We sacrifice our time of our body, etc. Here's, here's my point. Or here, here's another point. Do you know that if every single one of us in this room decided we were not going to serve God, we weren't going to do anything, we're just going to be selfish and do things our own way, that God would still accomplish whatever he wants to accomplish without us. In other words, before you get too big of a head, he doesn't need you and he doesn't need me. He's going to do what he wants to do without us, but he loves us so much that he opens up the the book and he says, listen, I want to allow you to be a part of the story that I'm writing. In other words, you get to be a part of his story, or another way of saying that, right, you get to be a part of history. You get to be a part of the story that God is writing, not because he needs you, but because he loves you so much, he opens it up and says, listen, I sent my son as a sacrifice for you. You now owe your life to me. The only logical thing is that you get to be a part of this book that I'm writing, the story of life change that is being created. I want to um, close with a, with a really cool story. There's a, a group of, there was a revival called the Moravian Revival. And out of the Moravian Revival, there were two particular people out of that revival that decided to become missionaries. A lot of other people became missionaries, but two in particular I just want to tell you about. And these two missionaries had a heart for this one island in the West Indies where there was just a tremendous amount of slavery happening. And they wanted to go in and reach the slaves on this island for Jesus. The problem with this is, is that the the island was owned by a wealthy British atheist who had no interest of inviting anyone onto the island to evangelize to his slaves. So what these two Moravian missionaries did is just incredible. They went to their families after praying to God about what it would look like to present their bodies as a living sacrifice to be able to accomplish the the mission that the Holy Spirit had put on their lives. And what they decided to do, the Holy Spirit's leading, was to sell themselves into slavery on this island and give up the rest of their life, the freedom that they would have experienced by selling themselves into servitude. And at one point they got on a boat They were about to head off to this island where they would never really be seen by their family again. They would die as slaves on this island. And to go go back and I want to encourage you to read a story of these Moravian missionaries, what they said as they're getting on the boat and leaving their families forever to reach these slaves for Christ. But essentially what they said was a lot what Amy Carmichael said before she went to India, is how could anything really be called a sacrifice? in light of what the Holy Spirit and God have accomplished for me through Jesus' death on the cross. And so I wanna ask you to now ask God, what now? What are you supposed to do with this information? What is the Holy Spirit prompting you to do right now in light of this information? I I wanna say a few things before you lock in on something. The first thing is this, church, if you want to be a mover and a shaker in your faith, it's going to require serving sacrificially. It's something that you just have to recognize. If I want to be a mover and a shaker, I want to be transformed in the likeness of Christ. Well, Christ was the ultimate example of sacrifice. If I want to be like him, I got to serve sacrificially too. That's number one. That's not a up for debate sort of thing. Another thing I want you to remember is this sign language, right? That we're, we recognize that there are things that we find valuable to us. And what God did for us on the cross was he willingly let go of those things and gave them up for something that was more important. And when we recognize that's what God's calling us into, to, to lay down our bodies to give ourselves of our time and our comfort and our resources in order to sacrifice those things for God. That's what that looks like. There's a story in um, 2 Kings chapter 17. I don't have time to go into detail about it, but I'll give you the, the cliff notes, all right? In 2 Kings chapter 17, 
there's a group of people that are not following God. They're not following God at all. And every time they would go out of the, the city gates, lions would come up and attack them and kill some of their people and they would retreat. And so they didn't know what to do about this. They couldn't leave because lions kept jumping in because they weren't following God and eating them up, okay? And so they find a priest and a priest comes into the story and teaches them how to fear the Lord. And at first, they learn this and they start uh, showing reverence to God and his ways and this, this problem is relieved. But then it says at the end of this, their story, this is how they, they chose to balance their two worlds. It says they feared the Lord that sounds good, but they served their own gods. They feared God, but they chose to serve other gods. For a lot of us in this room, you've made a decision to trust God with your life. You're like, listen, I fear the Lord. I recognize how good and powerful he is. I have a reverent fear of the Lord. But if you look at the way you're serving with your body, serving with your time and your talents and your resources, the evidence would actually point to you serving your own gods. Malachi 3.18 gives us the final gut punch. Here's what it says. Then you will again see the difference between the righteous and the wicked. Those who serve God and those who do not. This juxtaposition is really hard to miss. The righteous and the wicked, those who serve God and those who do not. And so I would ask you, as you're asking right now the Holy Spirit to put something on your heart, if you're not serving God with your life, one of the easiest ways to do that is just to grab a connect card out from the chair back in front of you. And all you gotta do is check a box saying, I wanna serve. I want to partner with my body of Christ. Give me something to do around here. I want to do it. And what we'll do is we'll call you and help you figure out what your gifts are and where you could serve here and give you an opportunity to serve. Maybe God's calling you to serve him in a different way. I don't know what the Holy Spirit just put on your heart, but whatever it is, my ask for you is to boldly be obedient to that calling and do it. It just makes logical sense. Let's pray together. Father, when we think about the incredible sacrifice that you made for us on the cross, it doesn't make sense to us. It doesn't make sense to me that you would choose to sacrifice your son in order to win little old me back to yourself. But I know that you chose to do it. You had a plan and that it was a plan of love. It was built around love for, for me and for your creation and that you long for us to be in relationship with you. And when I think about the sacrifice that you made for me on the cross, the only thing that makes sense to me is that I would present myself as a living sacrifice for you. Whatever it is you want me to do, I'm yours. Wherever you go, I wanna go. Whatever you want me to do, I want to do it. And God, would you allow us to be a church that thinks that way, that you would allow us to be a church of living sacrifices that are movers and shakers becoming more like you because we're willing to do whatever it takes to be transformed into your likeness. God, we love you and we thank you. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Well, we are so thankful for the truth that was shared in this message today. Please know that we, as a church, are praying that what you have learned today, the truths that God has put deep into your heart, will manifest themselves and grow themselves into something amazing. And as always, you can experience that with other believers, other people who are walking this walk of faith at ACC on Sunday mornings. Please remember this, you belong at ACC.